Hi, my name is Andrew Clemson. I'm a writer. Uh, I put out books like Star Bastard, Bet Noir, and Damsel from Distress. Uh, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very versatile and talented comic writer who I just happened upon uh, recently. He was one of the 50 plus people that got, uh, well, scheduled on the show. And so he's here today, all the way from way across the pond, way, way past the pond, I should say. <laughs> we are joined today by the comic writer and creator of Star Bastard, Bet Noir, and Damsel from Distress. How are you doing today, Andrew Clemson? I'm doing really well. Thanks so much for having me on. It's great to be here. Wow, it's good having you on as well, too. I happened upon your work. Uh, thank you, by the way, for, for the previews. I pre greatly appreciate it of your various comics here. And I loved it. You have a wide variety of, of genres that I find amazing and interesting from sci-fi space to a bit of fancy fantasy to a bit of, you know, uh, uh, noir and all the other stuff, but for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're all about. So I'm a, I'm a writer. I'm, I'm uh, I live in Dubai at the minute in the UAE. Uh, I'm originally from the UK. We moved out here with my family, sort of late eighties. This has been where I sort of called home for the last thirty odd years. I didn't really get into to writing until probably about. Five or six years ago, I sort of always wanted to, to work in comics when I was growing up. As these things do, that sort of falls by the wayside and you, you get a real job, so to speak. But uh, I had a, a bit of a moment five, six years ago when a friend of mine passed away and I thought, you know, what do I want to do if I was to, you know, get hit by a bus tomorrow? And for me, that thing was I wanted to have said that I'd done this thing I wanted to do when I was a kid. I wanted to put out a comic book quickly got to work doing that thing and luckily we we live in a world with with crowdfunding and stuff so <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot easier now with the internet uh being what it is than you know maybe it would have been all those years ago got into doing that sort of thing and then um you know once once you're in you, you can't get out so it's <laughs> just spiral from one project into another you have three current titles in under your your belt so to speak right mm -hmm. now currently with, with star bastard with bet Moore, and with damsel from distress which at the time of you scheduling this interview, you didn't have any Kickstarters, but miraculously, a couple of months later, you do. So tell us about the current Kickstarter that's ongoing uh, right now and uh, what's going on with it. We're currently running a Kickstarter for uh, the book we put out called Damsel from Distress, which is a, we call it an elves and espionage series. It's a, it's a bit of a mashup of things like James Bond and uh, Man from Uncle, which is where the title comes from, crossed over with Dungeons and Dragons or Zelda or Lord of the Rings. So you get a, a mix of all that sort of spy drama and gadgets and uh, espionage with all the sort of fantasy cliches and the monsters and the, the fairy tale characters. So it's a very fun, I would say all ages, it's, it's, you know, anyone could pick it up. There's nothing, nothing in it. It's like some of the other books, but it's doing really well. It's really popular. Thanks to Kickstarter, we've managed to fund three issues so far. And the one we're running at the minute is for issues four and five, which will wrap up volume one, you know, help people get the whole sort of first arc of that book. So then what is Bet Noir about? Because that was a, a darker one of the three that I read, but mm -hmm. it was beautifully drawn and, and well-written. I, I was intrigued by the characters. Bet Noir, weirdly, that was the first thing I actually wrote because everyone sort of thinks when they get into this that they're going to be the, you know, the next great auteur and you're going to be, you know, this just generation's Frank Miller or Alan Moore or something like that. So I had it in my brain that I was going to do this big hundred issue you know, magnum opus of a superhero epic. Luckily, since that point, we've done other things. We've realized what it takes to put out a book like that. So we managed to retool it um, into a, a nice sort of, I'd say a mini series, sort of, a, it's, a, it's a six issue book, which should be able to be a single volume uh, based around a sort of vigilante character who I have to very strongly insist is definitely not Batman for the purposes of copyright. <laughs> There's full of those characters which you will recognize and, you know, you're able to, to sort of fill in the blanks of those archetypes. But it's, it's about a, a character who's been dead for a, for a long time and he's come back uh, from the dead to take his revenge on the people that wronged him and his friends. And it's definitely not The Crow whatsoever. No, it's, that, that one's a bit more adult um, and it gets so it's, it's, it's pretty violent. Like I say, it was my attempt at being uh, yeah. 
being the next Frank Miller. It, it's helped along like all these things that like you mentioned, the art as, as a medium, the bulk of the weight, I think, of these things is helped carried by the art. And we have a fantastic guy called Chris. We were so lucky to find him because all the people we were talking to about the book, um, he came in pretty much at the last minute and just blew us away and ticked all the boxes we needed. Star Bastard itself, realistically, it feels like it's like ripped right out of the 80s and 90s with its just <laughs> over the top action and typical TNA that you you saw back then. Mm -hmm. It's like it's all muscles and, and scantily clad women with a bit pure, of space sci fi. Pure machismo. Yeah. It's, it's, yes, that was, um, it's weird. It's funny that you mentioned that because that, that book was intended as a sort of throwback to all of those things. You know, it's uh, the, the title of the book um, would suggest. It's um, it's all those sort of stereotypical bastards you'd find flowing around. You know, you've got Captain Kirk or Lobo or, you know, Peter Quill or all these guys that are just, you know, running around causing mayhem around, uh, around the galaxy all mashed up into one. And um, we tried to poke a little bit of fun at that, um, of that sort of hyper-masculine, uh, stylized mm -hmm. book from the 90s. So then as a comic writer and as a writer yourself for, for many years at that, what is the most misunderstood aspect about your career that maybe people that aren't in the industry uh, misconstrue? I think people, especially now, now there's movies and everything, you know, when I was growing up, it, comics weren't as popular. Now, obviously, there's a Marvel movie for even the, the smallest mm -hmm. characters that you wouldn't expect. I mean, we've got three Ant-Man movies, which is a bizarre world to live in. But because of that, everyone assumes, as soon as you say we put out comic books, they assume you're rich because you've, you know, you're guaranteed to have this movie deal lined up and all this kind of stuff. The uh, profit margins and the bottom lines in these things are so razor thin. I think that's the thing. Everyone assumes that you're going to be loaded as soon as you sell a few books, but it's quite the opposite. You're lucky, you know, especially in indie books, you're lucky to sort of uh, hit zero. That's the dream. <laughs> so then what is your creative kryptonite? Finding time to work on these things when it's not your full-time job mm -hmm. is, um, is difficult, you know, especially I've got two young kids you know, you find time where you can find it to, to get this stuff down. But I think, you know, that falls into a sort of difficulty more than a kryptonite. I think the self doubt, you know, like you say, social media being what it is, you see everyone else, your peers, you know, other, other people putting out similar or, you know, work of the same quality and you, you constantly compare yourself and it can cause you to, to pause, to hesitate. And you might have a great idea that you're really into and then something hits you, something you've seen and you just think, oh, what's the point? This is going to take too long. You know, I'm just going to forget about this one for the time being. So I think that's the real kicker is having, you know, you've got to keep that motivation and that self-confidence going and, um, and make sure you get these things out into the world whether you think they're going to do well or not. You've created so many different worlds. Themes of these worlds obviously sometimes stand out more than others when it comes to your writing. What were some of the themes that you created with your various works that you've done that kind of solidified yourself as a writer? Everything um, I've done, whether I've tried to avoid it or not, has ended up having comedy in it. Like I say, Star Wars was the first thing we put out, and that is just straightforward comedy. Like We pitched that as eastbound and down in space like um, you know get Danny McBride in we'll do an animated version you know it's pure ridiculous comedy we went back to Bet Noir um, and even though that thing is that's a dark book you know that's dealing with a lot of adult themes there is still jokes in there that you know people have said you know that that page made me laugh out loud and it's weird coming from a book like this Damsel is different genre but and, and different market really that's my most family friendly one you know, even though there's a heart to the story, it, it's still a lot of one-liners. There's still a lot of jokes going through it. So I think that's the thing, knowing that that's something that I enjoy writing because I enjoy it, it tends to produce better work. Knowing to lean into that, I think was the, the, you know, the best thing I learned while I've been writing all these sort of very, very different stories because you always want to do something different to keep, keep it interesting. I realized you have to stick to what you are good at you know, I'm not going to say I'm good at it, but what does well for you. And I think that's been the key for me is just don't, even if someone else is doing something and it's doing really well, and you know, you'd like to have a similar thing to that, identifying that maybe you're not the best guy for that job and someone else can do it better and you should stick at what you do well. So then what's the hardest part about being a writer, the beginning, the middle or the end of your process? I've done a different genre and a different 
type of book every time I've started something new. And I think I've changed how I work each time as well. I'd like to think that's me getting better at it. With Starbucks, that, that was really just a kind of bucket list thing. I wanted to have a book with my name on it. But if in case I got hit by a bus the next day, I want to have said I've done it. Because of that, I wrote one issue as a sort of joke and it did really well. It got picked up by a publisher. I did a second one. You've got to keep these things going. So there was no real overarching plan for it. With the other ones, I've started Bet Noir. I knew what the twist was and I wrote backwards. You know, I know where it ends and I w I'm going to start from the beginning and then work through it. Whereas Damsel, I sat down and did an, a complete beat by beat structure for it before we ever started anything. I think having done everything, like start from fresh with no idea, uh, start from the back and work, work backwards and do everything in one go. I think you know, the, the most important thing out of all of those would be knowing where your story finishes, because then you can always work towards it as opposed to trying to wing it all the way. I'm sure that works for some people, you know, more skilled writers than me can probably pull it off, but it's better for me if I know where I'm going. Do you think new writers should be outlining their works before they start their process? Or do you think that <clears throat> comes down to their own creativity like like you said where some people are just gifted that can just write out something others have to be structured i think it depends on the person i think it depends on the project i think a lot of my strengths lie in dialogue you know natural banter and dialogue for the mm -hmm. for the humor to land and i think a lot of that can't be planned and even if it is you find yourself going in a different direction you know once these characters are talking and you, you know you find the conversation going wherever it goes if you've got something where you're trying to get across a very specific message and you've got a very specific arc that's, you know, character arc that's going to tell that message, I think it's super important that you've got all these beats in place. You know, that's what we're having to do for Bet Noir is have all these beats in place so that you can see things which, once you know what happens, you can go back and see the progression uh, on a second read. If, if you can do it, do it on everything. For me, I think I would find myself frustrated by trying to hit goalposts along the way if the project was such that it could do with a lighter, more organic approach. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Growing up in Dubai, like I, I it's a very multicultural place. And, you know, when I was a kid in, uh, you know, primary school, high school, every kid in my class was from a different country. And so there's, there's a, a whole heap of different languages floating around. But where you find um, all these people have something in common is they've always, you know, most of them have consumed uh, similar media. You know, they've seen a similar film or they've read, a set, they've read the same book. And, you know, these, these stories that have been told through these mediums um, have touched people from different countries, different cultures, different languages, uh, you know, assuming they've either been translated or these people you know, I've read the English version. But I think the simple fact that a piece of language written down in a book can pass along the same information to people in all these different circumstances, that hit me very early. Reading comics and, and, and books, and then you, you can make friends with one, someone straight away just because they've read the same thing. They've learned the same lessons you have just from um, this inanimate object. Well, well, let's talk about Damsel from Distress. What was the hardest scene for you to write in that book? I like to think I'm very good at first issues because it's just a case of fun. You know, you start, you know, the action, you get through it, you sell the pitch, you're done and you, you know, you have a hook. I always find the middle sections the most difficult. You've got a beginning, you know, where you've got to start from, you know, where you've got to get to. You've got to be careful not to have fluff in the middle. So even though there's more important scenes at the end, you know, the end is really of that book specifically is where you, you're hit with all of the, you know, the actual emotional themes of the book. The beginning is is a lot more jokes and it tends to get a lot more darker in tone as it goes along. The middle, I found the scenes that had less impact, it's harder to write because you've got to make sure there's no fat there. You've got to make sure, you know, people, you don't, you're not losing people's interest, but you also got to make sure, you know, little bits of information are eking out. As much as I'd like to say it was hard to write the, the big emotional stuff at the end, it was harder to write the story stuff in the middle that gets you to that point. Have you used the same artist for all three books or have you used multiple artists? No, I like to work with different people for everything. For Starbucks, we had a, a chap called uh, Jethro Morales, who's from uh, the Philippines. He uh, 
worked on uh, books from Dynamite like uh, Red Sonja and Green Hornet, Army of Darkness, things like that. He's actually working at Marvel now, so I've lost him forever, I think. We had a letterer called HDE, who's a chap from uh, the UK, a colorist called Teo from Brazil, Teo Gonzalez. When we moved on to Bet Noir, uh, the artist is a chap called Chris from Indonesia. The letterer was HDE again, so that's the same letterer. Uh, the editor is a friend of mine from the UK, another writer called Matt Hardy, and Chris does all the coloring and stuff himself. Damsel again, we moved on, and the art is all done by a, a chap called Mauricio Mora from Costa Rica. We got uh, Hassan Otsman Elhau, who runs panel by panel. He's, you know, he's an Eisner winner for his comics journalist, journalism and a very prolific letterer. Very, very hard to put him down these days. So we managed to get him on board as editor and letter, uh, editor and letterer. You know, there's a very diverse, you know, spectrum of teams all across these books, especially when you're the, the writer and you're starting out and, you know, you want to be known for as much as you know, the breadth of your work as you can, I think it's important to give everything a unique, its own style and its own feel. You know, artists have a style which works for, for you know, one genre usually. Uh, you want to give them the best, best script and best content they can work with. Looking at all three of your series, when you wrote it on in your scripts and you finally got the art for it, what was your favorite scene that turned out way better in art form than it did via script they all turn out better <laughs> than script form like it, this is the crazy thing when you when you get these announcements for movies or you know cross media ip stuff more often than not we'll mention the writer you know sometimes it mentions the artist but you know the rest of the time everyone else has forgotten about and it's it's such a collaborative medium i can put across a script of beats to hit and dialogue that needs to be included and specific actions that that have to be taken to get to those points but I like to keep the scripts loose uh, as possible so that the artists can interpret them because they understand the visual side of things a lot better than I could hope to, especially when it comes to their strengths. And, you know, I might ask them to do something that one artist would think nothing of, but another artist would rather jump off a tall building than have to deal with that. You know, if you <laughs> give an artist a, a horse or a car or, you know, things like this, or, you know, I can write a thousand soldiers descend on a battlefield, and <laughs> da, 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 but, you know, the artist's head's going to explode. So... I can confidently say everything that I have had back from an artist on everything I've done from these, these series or anthologies or shorts or other stuff I've got coming up, it always comes back and I'm always surprised that it looks better than I expected. And that's true of every stage, you know, when you get the, 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 the roughs and the, the inks and the, the colored stage and the lettering. And it's a cool thing, you know, you can, you can make tweaks every stage. It's a, a great thing about the medium. So what are three things you have accomplished that you're, you're proud of? And what three things in the future are you looking forward to accomplishing? I'm proud of everything we put out. You know, the first book we put out straight away from a single issue, got a uh, publishing deal. We, we got that book out, got it to trade, you know, even with the pandemic and everything. Hmm. Bet Noir, you, you know, I'm proud that we got that thing from something which was so overcomplicated down to something nice and neat. And I think in doing that, we made a better product, you know, has gone down really well in terms of reviews and, and sort of critical reception and in terms of the the last thing i mean damsel just blew me away how popular it was we put put the first one on it did well it funded but the second one on you know it did twice as well you know we put this one on it's done as well as the last one within the first couple of days with uh, you know the whole campaign to run and and the crazy thing about that is that damsel just came from like a lot of things the name you know, came first just because I mis misheard someone say damsel in distress. My wife had asked me, I think how most people do, most creatives that work in this field, they'll get relatives and friends that say, hey, why am I not in your book? Why have you not made a character for me? And my wife asked why she wasn't in Star Wars. And I was like, look, you don't want to be in that book. That's not the book you want to be featured in. So I thought, you know, this one, this one would be a good opportunity. So the main character in Damsel is named after my wife. It was just a a script that I started writing just as a thing to say, hey, look, I put you in a book. But yet that one has done better than everything else. Is there anything that I haven't touched on that you'd like to those that are watching and listening to this interview? We'll, we'll talk about social media and where we can find you and how we can support you. Like a lot of people that do this sort of stuff, I'm not very good at um, talking about myself. It's good, you know, when there's a question thrown at you, you can sort of talk about it. Like, like I say, that's one of the struggles of this whole game is you, you've got to compete with everyone else on social media and you've got to sort of uh, beat your own drum to a certain extent. Some of us are not as great at that as others. 
So that's why the, things like this are so useful because someone can sort of uh, forcibly extract that information. You're good at what you do. So, you know, why not promote yourself? One, of, one out of 7 billion people is, is creative like yourself and, you know, you're, you're doing a good thing. So that works out. <laughs> Thank you very much. At what point are we good enough? You know, interesting, that question, when you apply it to the creative mindset that we have and, and a lot of the stuff we spoke about, like one of the biggest hurdles you can have is assuming that you're not good enough to do something. And everyone has had that concern. You know, the people that are winning Oscars for movies and, you know, Eisner's for comics at some point have thought they weren't good enough to do it. But everyone started, everyone got better and everyone put something out. And, you know, I know people who have worked on, you know, an idea for a comic and some people have got it, you know, to a script. Some people have got an entire book produced and cannot put it out because they're worried about the reception it's going to get. And maybe they're not, you know, maybe it's not going to be received as well as I would like and all this kind of stuff. So it never goes out. Finishing something and putting it out is better than not bothering. Invariably, the first thing you do is going to be terrible. You know, I'll hold my hand up <laughs> to be true of that. Every time you do something, you're going to get better at it. So I think, you know, worrying about when you are good enough is not as important as worrying, you know, will you get to be good enough? You know, will you, will you get to be good at what you want to do at some point in the future? That's a, that's a valid worry. And I think that will, um, you know, that will put a fire under you to get better. But, you know, worrying, you know, whether you are currently good enough is just, it's a, it's a waste of time and it will, it will just cause you to never put anything out and you never will be good enough. What is one mistake you'll never do again in your life? I don't know. I mean, I don't want to be mean to <laughs> places I've been. I don't think I'm ever going to go to Las Vegas again. I, I don't know. I mean, the, the thing is, everything you do gets you to where you are. Right? You know, you could say, I'd like to do this different. I'd like to do that different. But everything is a cumulative experience that, that gets you to a certain point. I think you've just got to take everything good and the bad and treat it as the learning experience it is. Having said that, there's definitely some restaurants that I've had, a, you know, a rough morning after a, a visiting. Uh, and I don't think I'll ever drink Sambuca again after some student nights out a few decades ago. But other than that, not much. When did your life change for the better? I think it's, the, it's a corny answer, but I've got two kids. The cliche of your mindset changing overnight, I think it's a true one. My son is five years old literally overnight you change from me to us you know and what can you know what can I do to make everything better I think without that I wouldn't have had any drive to really to better myself in this you know I want to be doing this so that I can do something I enjoy and I can show them this is what it's like to do something for a living that you enjoy doing I think most people with kids will, will tell you that you can't really get that clarity of thought without kids having said that i haven't had clarity of thought for the last last few years that goes with the uh, goes with the course of having young kids how do you think the birth of creativity was formed i think you know we created animals and i think i think very early it's easier to explain concept uh, complicated concepts with a, a bit of shine on them right a bit of creative shine so i think at, at some point things which are difficult to explain uh, without the experience, I think, you know, thousands and thousands of millions of years ago, whatever it was, like stories evolved to teach lessons that you, you shouldn't have to go through that life experience to learn that lesson. So, you know, things that will teach you to be, to be wary of, uh, of certain aspects of life or whatever. I, I think that's, it's an important defensive mechanism that people have evolved to, to, you know, pass down that collective my last four questions I ask, actually, I have five, but <clears throat> the fifth one, the final one is a fun one. So, you know, not, okay. nothing too brain busting. But the last four questions I normally ask are for a documentary called Little Person Amongst Media Giants. And it's because I wanted to interview Stan Lee and I never got a chance to. So, uh, I, Do you know how close I was as well? I, my son's middle name is Stan Lee. Mm. We named him after him. And um, he, in 2018, he was going to come to uh, the Kuwait Comic Con, which is, you know, just, it's like a 40 minute flight for me from here, 2018. So I you know, got on a plane, went over there, you know, booked my ticket, 
you had to pre-book a meet and greet and all that kind of stuff, signature and stuff. Um, and, and the only thing I took with me, any Spider-Man stuff, X-Men stuff, any memorabilia, I took over, we had a picture of my son, he was like less than one, I think he was like nine months or something, had him in a Spider-Man t-shirt with a Mjolnir and all this kind of stuff. And I took that over and I was going to get that signed, you know, I'll give it to him when he's 18 type yeah. thing. But um, suffice to say, he didn't make it. Um, I think that was, you know, towards the end where he's, you know, getting yeah. uh, taken advantage of a little bit. But um, yeah, that was, that was getting for me because I'd never met him. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to do that and say, you know, thanks for everything. But Yeah, I, I got to see him briefly. And by briefly, I mean 30 seconds worth. Uh, I was at a... Oh, yeah. Motor City Comic Con in Detroit, and uh, suddenly, as we were leaving the convention, um, uh, the side door burst open, and four of the largest security people slash ex football players I've ever seen are escorting Stanley out of the convention into a, a moving van, and and pass right by me, and he goes, "Thanks for coming out, true believers," and he just got oh, whisked man. into the van, and <laughs> so he's just showed. I mean, yeah, that. That's the thing, isn't it? Where he's, you know, zinging off the one-liners and stuff. That's what you expect. I spoke to people who were saying, you know, they saw the last sort of appearances and just nothing. Yeah. So yeah. better to see him like that. But we were the only two at the side of the building and the door burst open. He's there. So I've like had loads of those. The Comic-Con we had in, uh, when was it, April? and no, March. Our, our local Comic-Con we had. And I was chatting to someone and I just got shoulder barged into a wall. And uh, I was like, what on earth was that? And it was, it was the security guards again for that, um, how do you say his name, Barry Ke Keoghan, the Irish chap who was in um, The Joker in the new Batman. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was okay. walking around. You know, he's a super nice guy, but it's, you know, I think overzealous. <laughs> Peter Mayhew, <laughs> Chewbacca, stepped on, mm. nearly stepped on me twice, actually, at two separate comic conventions. Nice. And then Ernest Borgnine nearly ran over my foot in his wheelchair uh, as well. Excellent. So, so I was like... So I've had Could have him to sign the car. That yeah. would have been a good uh... probably would have broken my toe, but luckily I, I moved out of the way. But super nice people. <laughs> Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who is that for you? If I can sneak in two answers to that. Mm -hmm. Like you've you've got the corny one, you know, Stanley from growing up, you know, I, I had all the cartoons and you can hear his voice and you, you know, all that enthusiasm and you you're so you know, I did especially growing up on handed down media and stuff like I, I associated him with the stuff I enjoyed. I know that, you know, now you understand there's a million more people uh, behind it, but I think um, that was someone that really got me excited about, you know, the medium I'm now working in from a slightly different tone. Like I say, a friend of mine that had passed away that sent me on the road to, to giving it a go and, and wanting to do it. I'm, you know, I'm just picking a million people here, but like I say, my kids, everything I do now, I, I write with an eye to them reading it one day and making it, you know, you want to be it to be as good as you can so that they're proud of what you've done. Um, even though it's nonsense about, you know, people punching each other in tights, you still want it to be something they look at down the road and, and think is good. From a professional perspective, you have created three books. Well, I should say three series, not, not three books, but you've created three series uh, that have done very well not only from Kickstarter, but from other sales and professionally, you are creating more comics in the future as well too. So professionally, you are a successful person. Do you consider yourself personally successful? No, I mean, I don't <clears throat> because this is the thing we, you know, we, we all fall into the trap of social media and, you know, there's always someone that you can look at and say is more successful. I'm naturally that sort of person that, you know, I look at what I've done and think, yeah, it's okay. You know, I do this at Comic Cons, like I'll table next to people. People come up and say, Tell me about your book. And I'll be like, Yeah, it's fine. But have you seen this guy's stuff? That's just the way I am, type thing. So I know I, you know, we are doing well with what we're doing. But I think until until I'm able to pay the bills with it, I think that's that'll be my benchmark. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I think, especially in what we're doing. There isn't really, or at least I haven't experienced anything which I would classify as a failure. Like we've, I've had Kickstarters that have been unsuccessful, but then you retool them, come back, launch them again, make them better and see what was wrong. The closest thing that you deal with is when you 
you maybe read a review that isn't so favorable um, or, you, you know, you, you see a tweet or a post from someone that says they didn't enjoy your thing. But um, again, the, the, one of the most important things I've learned from doing this over the years is that, you know, really you want people to dislike it to a certain degree. You know, you want, you don't want to make something that's for everyone because then it's going to be so bland and uh, unappealing. You want something that a few people are going to absolutely love. Um, and if that means that other people are not going to get it or they're not going to enjoy it, then, you know, you shouldn't at least sleep over that because there'll be something else that those people can enjoy. You know, it's not, it's not their fault. You've written it for yourself and, and by proxy, you've written it for people like you. So I think in that sense, it's good to fail. The younger generation is looking at your work and then becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic writer or artist or whatever they would like to do creatively. And the fact that you have the younger generation currently with you as well, I'm sure they'll be creative in some way, shape, or form. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? The thing for, you know, people that are, you know, not in a position to begin, you know, people that are, you know, dreaming about doing stuff in the future. I think the most important thing they can remember is that everyone was in that position and and the the key is to you know think about what you wish you could see in the stuff that you're reading growing up or you're watching or whatever and and when you get to a position to make that stuff make it you know it, it doesn't matter if if you know kids that are, are reading books now they want to do something completely different to what i'm putting out or people from my generation are putting out when you come to that point, you put out whatever you like and you don't worry about what we wanted or what we enjoyed because one day we're going to be in the ground and you guys are the market. So, you know, that, that's the most important thing is to just keep producing stuff that you like. And, and if you don't see it in the market, create it and you put it into the market. If your life was a comic book or a movie, what would the title be? And if it was a movie, what would the musical soundtrack be? title i don't know i think it would be so full of uh, expletives and swear words you wouldn't be able to put it on a movie poster but i think the the soundtrack uh would be uh, uh dare to be stupid from mm -hmm. widow yankovic i think that's the you know it's widow yankovic but i think it um i think it's it's quite a, a true lyric like you just gotta you know do whatever you want like as long as it doesn't hurt anyone just be as dumb as you want do whatever makes you laugh and, um, you know, don't take everything too seriously. So how excited are you about the Weird Al Yankovic film coming up? I am genuinely excited <laughs> and I hope it's as weird as it should be. Like I, I kind of hope it's more, um, you know, less uh, walk the line and more walk hard. Yeah. I like, just do it stupid. And I think it's great that Daniel Radcliffe's in it because that guy, there's something about, you know, those young actors, they're just, just do weird films. You know, they're not trying to be the next big action star. They're just picking cool, weird projects to do and, you know, being as weird as they like. He's had a string of really good films, like just yeah. off the wall things. Like I, I saw him in Horns and I thought that was yeah. just an incredibly well done film. And there was that one where he like, um, was he the corpse or was the other yes. guy the corpse? No, I can't remember. He, he was the corpse, uh, yeah. Swiss Army Man. Yeah, yeah. And then he's in that Sandra Bullock movie, like, good for him. Like, just yeah. do as weird, you know, pick these little things. He's like, it's like he's going to be the new, this generation's Nicolas Cage. Yeah, yeah. But he'll have better, better grossing films. Yeah, better accountant. Well, I do hate to say this, Andrew, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Before I let you go, and thank you so much for coming on the show. I do greatly appreciate it. Where can we find you and how can we support you online? And of course, where can we find the Kickstarter for Damsel from Distress? Yeah, I have, um, I have a website, which is clemsoncomics.com. Uh, Very easy to remember, especially for Americans, because you've got the university. Everyone remembers that. On Twitter, my, my handle is just Andrew Clemson. Uh, I'm on Instagram and stuff like that, but I never do anything, so don't bother. The, the minute, like I say, we're running uh, the Damsel campaign, which will, it's the seventh of May now, so I think it ends like the, the first week of June. Um, if you uh, just search for Damsel from Distress uh, on Kickstarter or for my name, um, you should be able to find the project. Um, and if you don't make it before the end of the project, we'll have it running on back kit um, for people that might have missed it. 
Thanks so much for coming on the show. Greatly appreciate it. Of course, you can find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. And of course, on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia, which is a lot more updated than our website because I'm only one person. So give me a break, huh? And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking.